All right, we're going to do two poems by Coleridge today. Um, the one I'll spend the, the bulk of the time on is The Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner, which I don't know, did you do it in first year here with me? I, I teach, okay, I teach it in first year English. Um, but like most things I do in first year English, I think it goes over people's heads. I think most of what I teach here in first year, um, people catch enough of it to, to want to do more, but they've actually missed 90%. And that's just teaching. And um, there, there is a school of teaching that says you should only give people what they understand and come away with, but that I don't actually believe that myself, that that's what you should do because you don't know how much that threshold is, first of all. And you can't give everything so it's all over their heads or nobody is going to follow and take interest, but there has to be something there that you latch on to and enough to encourage you that it's sufficiently interesting that you want to do more. Um, but if it's a great work of literature, which is what I try to teach only here, then it uh, certainly uh, rewards a second, a third, a fourth reading. And you can, you can find more, even if I say the same thing, you'll, you'll hear something more. And that's a tribute to the fact that you're actually, um, your knowledge of things and understanding of the issues advances over time. Oops, what on earth did I do there? So let me get this back here. And so this is a fragment. Um, he said it came to him in a dream. He said he halfway through the dream, he woke up and that was the end of the poem. He couldn't recall it. Um, whether this is accurate, uh, what the nature of the dream was. Um, was he taking laudanum at the time? And so he drug induced, who knows? Um, What's interesting is he didn't complete the poem. And as I said to you last time, uh, fragments are a, a form unto themselves in this period. So it's an intentionally crafted, incomplete poem. And um, characteristic of the period. Uh, so much so that you either they're just the sorts of people who are perfectionists and can't let it go, but then why would you publish it if it wasn't finished? Or there's an intent to the form, and that's the, do that's the dominant view of the critics, is that it is a, an intentionally incomplete form. And the purpose of the incompleteness may have something to do with the romantic poetics and the political temper of the day, which is democratic in tendency. And we've already seen in Wordsworth's preface to Lyrical Ballads how he talks about his desire to change the subject matter of poetry, historically speaking, and moving it away from aristocrats and, uh, and battles and the subject matter of conventional neoclassical poetics uh, towards rustic life, towards um, lonely individuals, towards mothers, towards children, um, towards uh, even uh, criminals. He mentions in uh, Tinter Nabby, a, vag a vagrant in the woods. A vagrant is a criminal, not just a solitary individual. Um, and, th and that is very common in the period. And so with that in mind, what is the poetics in any way congruent with that general tendency? And the dominant reading of the critics is that, yes, it is. And the purpose is to suggest that the author is not authoritative in a sense, in a um, the reader's mind will complete the fragment. So it's invite the poet's spirit is inviting the reader's spirit to imagine what's happening here and to some degree to, well, you complete the story. I know that happens these days. There are types of stories where they have alternative endings depending on which choice you make there. It goes to that. It, that's not what we have here, but it's leaning in that direction of uh, your imagination having been awakened by the poet, you now um, imagine for yourself. But again, it also fits the idea of what we also talked about in relation to Tintern Abbey, namely the idea of a ruin as a sublime object, whereby nature in its power and might had slowly worked upon a grand human artifact and effectively dissolved it brought it to a ruin. And those ruins are found all over romantic and gothic literature. 
and thereafter have a sort of an aesthetic to them which people appreciate. Um, rather than the complete perfect work like in the Renaissance, if you look at Michelangelo's, uh, he, he has four sculptures called the Pieta, uh, Mary and Jesus, four different ones. And one of them looks totally unfinished. Like it's still, um, you can see the beginnings of, you know who's there. But, the, but the, the, it's obvious that he hasn't completed it because there's a lot of the stone in behind it that's evident, whereas in the, la the latest version, uh, Mary and Jesus are not only complete, but they're polished, they're shining. And um, if you compare the one to the other, the one seems to be stuck in marble, and the other, the marble has lost the background. Here, it's more like that where it's stuck in the background, it's not yet completed, and there's something sublime about the incompleted work. When I say it's similar, it's different insofar as in the natural sublime, there is a, a suggestion of a destructive force. So something once was like the finished version of Michelangelo's Pietà, and then wind and rain and uh, just natural elements have worn it down. And it's the, uh, the wearing down of the object which is what makes it supply. It suggests a power greater than the creator of the artistic object. So I, I think that this is a credible suggestion explaining a type of literature we see in this period and not really before that. If you find fragments in the ancient world, it's just because a papyrus has been ripped. Right? It's, that's all we have. You know, it stops off. Here it's an incompleted, incomplete work and deliberately so. So it could be a democratic motive, it could be suggesting sublimity and, and the power, uh, a greater power than that of the poet. Um, in either case, it's so ubiquitous that it, it should be noted as a feature of the period. Um, and so with that, there is a tendency towards um, what we would historically call evil in the in the literature because now in, in the in the form of a fragment it's not evil but it does suggest power uh, that's destructive and removes something that was good it takes it away so it's the privation of the good as augustine calls it privato uh, boni privation of the good so it's the absence of the good uh, so that you can see if the, if the Abbey, Tintern Abbey, is this wonderful completed work and yet it's been eroded, it does suggest the power, but that power of destruction is, uh, historically speaking, attributed to evil, not good. God, God creates things good, finished, perfect, distinguishable, right? Light from darkness and so forth, no, no shades. Um, no sense of vastness or immensity that's not being worshipped in this period the immensity the vastness and to some degree the destructive power of the elements is being uh, lauded as a greater form of artistic excellence so this is noteworthy and I, I, in our literary theory course we'll say more about that and connect it to Edmund Burke and his uh, treatise uh, on the origin of our ideas of the sublime and the beautiful. I'll say more about it then though. Uh, let's just read this poem. As I say, it was, as it says here, a poem came to him a dream, but that he was interrupted by a visitor while writing it down, so could not recover the rest of it. So he, in his dream, it was a greater reality and we only have a fragment of that. Famous poem, however, once again, Kubla Khan. Kubla Khan is the um, successor of Genghis Khan. So great warrior. In Xanadu did Kubla Khan a stately pleasure dome decree, where Alf, the sacred river, ran through caverns measureless to man down to a sunless sea. So twice five miles of fertile ground with walls and towers were girdled round. And there were gardens bright with sinuous rills, where blossomed many in an incense-bearing tree. And here were forests 
ancient as the hills, enfolding sunny spots of greenery. But oh, that deep romantic chasm which slanted down the green hill athwart a cedarn cover. A savage place, as holy and enchanted as e'er beneath a waning moon was haunted by woman wailing for her demon lover. And from this chasm, with ceaseless turmoil seething, as if this earth in fast, thick pants were breathing, a mighty fountain momently was forced, amid whose swift, half-intermitted burst huge fragments vaulted like, like rebounding hail or chaffy grain beneath the thresher's flail. And mid these dancing rocks, at once and ever, it flung up momently the sacred river. Five miles meandering with a mazy motion through wood and dale, the sacred river ran, then reached the caverns measureless to man, and sank in tumult to a lifeless ocean. And mid this tumult, Kubla heard from afar ancestral voices prophesying war. The shadow of the Dome of Pleasure floated midway on the waves, where was heard the mingled measure from the mount fountain and the caves. It was a miracle of rare device, a sunny pleasure dome with caves of ice. A damsel with a dulcimer in a vision once I saw. It was an Abyssinian maid, and on her dulcimer she played singing of Mount Abura. Could I revive within me her symphony and song, to such a great delight t'would win me, that with music loud and long I would build that dome in air, that sunny dome, those caves of ice, and all who heard should see them there, and all should cry, beware, beware, his flashing eyes, his floating hair, weave a circle round him thrice, and close your eyes with holy dread. For he on honey dew hath fed and drunk the milk of paradise. And the poem. So it's barely 50 lines, 54 lines. It is. And uh, incomplete. You could probably put three dots at the end of there of that. But it's obvious that it is not a completed poem because it is giving us a narrative, but the narrative is interrupted. I mean, it's not a lyrical ballad. It's presented as a dream sequence. And the dream it does not lead us to the end of the dream, where the narrative reaches anything like a conclusion. And um, with respect, again, back to this idea of a fragment, uh, works historically have a beginning, a middle, and an end. And Aristotle talks about that in his poetics has a beginning, it has a middle, it has an end. That's what constitutes a work of art. And they all, the end uh, is entailed in the beginning. There's a connection there. There's a plot. There's a uh, characterization which advances the plot, etc. Here we're breaching that and doing it as a, a deliberate act on the poet's part, suggesting that the ending again, is up to the reader. But to some degree, the author is almost preferring that there's an incompleteness. <coughs> and in this, it seems to me, it, it's certainly noteworthy that uh, we are breaking with a long standing tradition. I, I cannot think of exceptions, really, uh, where not just solitary poems, but frequently a whole class of poetry is written which is uh, intentionally incomplete. And the incompleteness is suggestive of something that is really uh, questioning whether Aristotle is correct that a work of art has a beginning, a middle, and an end. And it seems to me it's also questioning uh, the idea of uh, biblical ideas of the world as well, for that matter, that there is a divine author. He is a, uh, his handiwork is complete. 
he is involved in it and he will complete it. The book of Revelation concludes in a garden where it began once in a garden. It began in a garden uh, where Adam and Eve are cast out of the garden and the first thing that their treacherous son Cain does is he goes and builds a city after he kills his brother. In the book of Revelation we have another city and it's a garden city. It's a city in which there are no gates to keep the enemy out. It's also no sun because the sun is God and he's in the midst of the city. There's light. He provides the light, etc. So there's all sorts of, you look at the end of the book of Genesis and you compare it to the beginning of scripture and you can see a deliberate interaction there and a sense of fulfillment. Whatever the fulfillment means, there's no denying that there's a reference and allusion to the previous text and hence a sense of completeness of what began in this way. So this is going against that ubiquitous tendency in Western art to think that a completed work of art is, uh, is the aim of the artist. <coughs> and once this uh, tendency t away from completion begins, uh, it doesn't stop. It starts unraveling. And I, we, we talked about this briefly in relation to um, how the move towards blank verse and away from rhyme in the period eventually moves to uh, away from even rhymed verse and towards blank, you know, just uh, even stream of consciousness. So the structure of a poem starts to collapse and it becomes, with each successive generation of artists, the project becomes deconstructing what was a regarded as a finished view of what art, is, art intends to do. So art has a purpose, and we've talked about that in our History of Lit Theory class as well. And the purpose is to teach and to delight. It's to create delight, and it's to instruct in things that everyone knows are good and true and beautiful. That's the purpose of the artist, is to uh, delight his audience in things that are true and good and beautiful. And there's no disagreement on that front. Here there is a big shift away from that. Uh, there is an idea that incompleteness, or, or if you will, chaos or absence has greater force and importance than presence. Or silence has greater significance than words. And so I think it's the beginning of what in the 20th century we will call, or Jacques Derrida will call, anti-logocentrism as the project of deconstruction, to deconstruct the word-based delimited reality which has been inherited throughout Western civilization. Um, some of the romantics that we're going to look at, specifically Shelley and Byron, will embrace this full-throatedly as a satanic project. They, they present their heroes as in forms that um, are obviously referring to Milton's Satan. The way Milton describes Satan, they pick these up and the Byronic hero is effectively a satanic figure. Um, in attributes, if not, you know. Uh, and they're very sympathetic to that, not just sympathetic, they, they advance it. So some are very explicit about it, but others are less specific about the person of Satan or the devil and are more um, subtle. And this is the case here. Now, I'm not suggesting demonic uh, intentions on Coleridge's part. I'm just talking about a general observation about the effect of d destroying purpose and meaning in a work of art as a completed product of the artist's imagination. And it is to, as I say, prevent absence as greater than presence. And the privatio boni is greater than boni. The privation of the good is greater than the good. That's, and it pushes that the sublime is greater than the beautiful, in other words. And that's because it sees that the sublime and the beautiful are not um, in a continuum. So the, the sublime is not the most beautiful thing uh, anymore. It is a totally different aesthetic experience. And in, you can find it if you want to trace it in painting, you can find that the painters start to deconstruct the landscapes. It goes through the Impressionist phase. 
and on to the cubist phase where, and then eventually you can come to the blank canvas phase. Same thing in music, by the way, where there's harmony and then there's discord and eventually there's types of music that have no apparent structure at all and then you even have silence, John Cage's music, where silence is, you have a concert in which there is no note being played on any mu musical instrument. You listen to people sitting in the room and probably scraping their, stool, uh, their chairs on the floor every once in a while and coughing. That's, that's the finished work. At that point, there's nothing left there, of course. But I, 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 the only reason I mention that is this is a tendency to deconstruct as an artistic ideal. And it's very much, it's not just different than the past, it is categorically opposed to it. And it begins in this period, I think, as a poetic project. And the poetic fragment is a great way of uh, illustrating that. Having said that, it, here there are references to, uh, Coleridge is an extraordinarily learned man. And he is not going to just, uh, he's certainly not going to be a late 20th century artist where the, the references to silence and blankness and nothing there. This is littered with references to historical and biblical uh, allusions. So for example, the Alf, uh, Genesis 2. There are four, four uh, rivers in paradise. River went out of Eden to water the garden, and it became into four heads. The first, name of the first was Pison. Uh, the second is Gihon. The third is Hidakel. And the fourth is the Euphrates. Now, uh, Alf here is probably a reference to the first, but there is a, vo they, there is a learned uh, poem on Kubla Khan, uh, or not a poem, a book, a whole book on this on the allusions that Coleridge's makes, Coleridge makes here. And I think this is probably one uh, of the first river, as in the Alpha. And um, so it has a paradisal allusion al here. And the, um, if, even if you don't buy that, it's clear in Xanadu that there is something like a utopian fantastic scene being presented here. It's not just uh, the Mongol uh, king of the day. More is being intended by this. He, he, there's a paradisal uh, scheme here. But the paradise is, has sublime features. It's limitless. The caverns are measureless to man, down to a sunless sea. That's a strange description. And again, he, he's, it's a dream, so I guess the usual rules of description can be contradicted in a dream sequence. But what, what does a measureless cavern mean and a sunless sea? It's a sublime description. Again, you don't associate the sun with the sea anyway, but here he's pulling them together and saying there is no sun. So it's a dark place. It sounds like the underworld, actually. It sounds like possibly uh, hell, possibly, because there's no light where there's no sun. And it's twice five miles of fertile ground with walls and, and towers were girdled around. And there were gardens bright with sinuous rills. Well, how can the, the gardens be bright if there's no sun? Or is it the sea that has no sun and everywhere else somehow there is sun? It's not clear and he doesn't want to make it clear per se. It's, um, it's not a descriptive. Uh, it's in the sense that you can, okay, this and now I can put this down. And if I were to draw a picture of Coleridge's description, I could come up with a painting. I don't think you could do that. It's suggestive, suggestive of visual things, and yet it's more the qualities of these things that he intends with it than the actual uh, objective description. And there's an incense-bearing tree, obviously um, important for worship, and forest ancient as the hill, and sunny spots of greenery. So there is that, but in the midst of the goodness, there are suggestions of evil, significant suggestions of evil. That, that deep romantic chasm 
which slanted down the green hill athwart a cedarn cover, a savage place, a savage wild place, a place where there's no domestication. But the, there's holiness attributed to it for that matter. So there's holiness attributed to darkness and potentially with evil. And that is amplified by what he says in book in line 16 beneath a waning moon was haunted by a woman wailing for her demon lover. I mean, there's no uh, way of reading that in any other way. It's explicitly uh, evil in at least its suggestions. And uh, that's a theme he'll pick up in Christabel, by the way. We're going to read Christabel, and it's very much clear that there is a, uh, it's demonic, the intent of the poem. Uh, and it's a serpent. And again, the, uh, Milton's Satan being a serpent and the connotations of that are being played with by Coleridge repeatedly. So I think all the romantics, if you think that there's a reference to Milton in the writing when you encounter it, you're probably right. It's almost certainly so. He, he really does uh, fill their imaginations here. But at any rate, and from this chasm, but it runs again, a chasm is a void. It's a darkness. It's a pit. It goes down. Great word, by the way, chasm. It just has that um, the sound. With ceaseless turmoil seething, and if as if this earth in fast, thick pants were breathing. Again, terrifying suggestions. A mighty fountain momently was forced amid those whose swift, half-intermitted bursts, huge fragments vaulted like rebounding hail or chaffy grain beneath the thresher's flail. So uh, again, a, a scene of, some would say Neoplatonic, um, in the sense that Plotinus suggests that being is like a fountain that overflows, and all being comes from a, from a, a, a watery source, if you will. Uh, that's Plotinus. Um, makes that reference regularly. So there's something of that. Um, but he's, he's connecting that with other associations that would have nothing to do with Plotinus. But they certainly have a allusions to various things. And again, a secret river and a wood and a dale and caverns measureless to man and the lifeless ocean. <coughs> and again, you can see there perhaps in both uh, all of these allusions of sublimity a sort of reference to a a dead world uh, and perhaps something in aware of an awareness of how biblical imagery works as it develops so in the beginning god creates the land and the seas and the heavens and the earth and the light and the darkness and so forth but as scripture uh, uh, progresses, certain things start to acquire connotations which were not obvious there in the beginning. And one of those is the sea, uh, which starts to become associated with, with evil. And in, in Psalm 2, for example, when it says, why do the nations rage and the nations plot in vain against the Lord and is anointed, uh, that word for rage is a word that I understand the Hebrew echoes the rippling of waters. So there's a sense of the, it, it has a naturalistic imagery and the sea is portrayed in the uh, prophetic writers of the Old Testament in hostile terms. It's not, so as if the, the sea were going to, were, were against the people of God. And the Red Sea to some degree is an illustration of that even. They pass through evil. So when he parts the Red Sea, it is a, a miraculous event. But it's more than a miraculous event. It, it's a symbolic event. Evil is something that destroys things, and so is the sea. It's a destructive force. Nobody can live in that sort of water. And, and there's a, uh, a sense of evil in association with seas that arises in Hebrew, the Hebrew imagination thereafter, uh, to the point where um, in, when Jesus walks on the waters in scripture, I've noted this many times, that passage where he walks on the water, 
It actually says thalassa there, the sea. It doesn't say water. It says sea. So he's walking on the sea, and you say, well, what's the difference? Well, it's Lake Galilee. It's not a sea, first of all. And the writer knows that, but he says the sea. And why does he say the sea? Because he's, he's, he's showing his dominion over evil. That's my reading of the text. That's why he uses specifically the word sea there. The sea represents evil. Jesus, by walking over the sea, shows that evil, uh, that he's greater than evil. Not just that he's able to do something the rest of us can't do, but that evil cannot defeat him. Um, and and the, the final thing we could say on that is in at the, book, the end of the book of Revelation, when God creates a new heavens and a new earth, it says there's no more sea. There is no more sea. And it's not because God didn't originally create the sea. It's because by that point, the intent of that reference is to say that there's no more evil. There are more na no more natural um, hostilities towards mankind. It's all gone. Every tear is wiped away, all evil, no more sickness, no more crying, no more pain, no more death, no more sea. The sea has that strong evil reference there. So again, here I think when he speaks of a lifeless ocean, and remember in Revelation 12, it talks about the beast that's by the, by the sea. The woman, uh, her child, and the dragon, and they're, and they're by the edge of the sea. It's a phrase in English, caught between the devil and the deep blue sea. Right? I don't know if you've heard the phrase before, but it is in English. Caught between the devil and the deep blue sea. And the sea, the devil's evil, the sea is also evil. Between, it's another way of saying uh, the, between a rock and a hard place, Scylla and Charybdis. Same sort of sense. So anyway, um, and mid this tumult, and they, again, the tumult is chaos. And what does he hear? Ancestral voices prophesying war. So all of these are destructive forces, chaotic forces. Uh, scripture repeatedly refers to God as uh, creating good and orderly things. He separates and distinguishes. He finishes things. There's a completeness. He says it's good and it's good and it's very good. And then he rests because it's finished. It's completed. It can be further perfected, but it's not that there's an, it's not an incomplete work. So God gets to six days, and then on the seventh day, he says, if I can only get to day eight, then I'll, I'll finish this whole project. And it's already done. When mankind is created in the image of God, God's finished. And he rests, and he restores what's already there, and he's active in the created order. But there's a sense of completeness. Here we have the sense that we find in Babylonian literature where chaos is the fundamental principle of life. Same with ancient Greek literature, same with ancient Roman literature. They believe that chaos is the, is the nature of things. It's anarchic, it's destructive, it's warlike, and since that's the nature of ultimate reality, it also ought to inform the way we behave. So this is the, and so it has a revolutionary uh, motivation. If ultimate reality is marked by chaos and disorder, then if we want to flourish, we ought to, we ought to embrace the chaos principle ourselves and destroy things. And that, as I said, that seems to be the tendency of art post-romanticism. It m goes further and further and further in that direction, more in a destructive, deconstructive, however you want to present it, direction. Not accidentally, but purposefully. And what, ironically, <coughs> of all these things, calls it progress. <coughs> the distinctiveness of God's created order down to light and darkness and good and evil and male and female, it wants to pull those apart, deconstruct them, and then reconstruct them to build back better, if you will. <laughs> Need to be too political here, but. Uh, he then sees a, da a damsel with a dulcimer, so an uh, ancient musical instrument like a lyre, uh, an Abyssinian maid, all the, again, the references to the East and the mystery, the mystery associated with, 
with the Eastern world. Again, the Romantics loved the Eastern world. Uh, it was Sir Walter Scott that uh, praised Islam, uh, idealized it actually in many ways, and was very much at the forefront, Walter Scott being a contemporary here, um, or a little bit after, who very much led to a reassessment of, of Islam in the Western mind, um, romanticizing it, it may, presenting them more or less as noble savages a great civilization, et cetera, but, but lauding it in that sense. Heroic, uh, obtaining bad press from the West, that sort of stuff. I'm not, I'm not gonna amplify that here, but have a look at Sir Walter Scott uh, and the intent, and a great deal of interest in Oriental languages at this point then. Uh, study of Sanskrit and uh, study of uh, ancient Eastern languages. Uh, in the Western world and study of Eastern religions for that matter and preference of Eastern religions over Western religions. Eastern religions being all atheistic or there's no God in Eastern religions so in that sense atheistic so there's an absence there. They worship nothing. Uh, as a good, as a, an ideal versus a Western religion where there is a personal God in some form whether it's uh, Christianity, Judaism, or uh, even Islam. There's some sense of a personal God, not, not so in Eastern religions. So a leaning in this direction on the religious front, just like on the artistic front, towards destruction and chaos and uh, emptiness as a good thing, as a creative thing. So she, he hears this Abyssinian maid singing of Mount Abora, and could I revive within me her symphony and song to such a deep delight twould win me and that with music loud and long I would build that dome in air, that sunny dome, those caves of ice, and all who heard should see them there, and all should cry, beware, beware, his flashing eyes, his floating hair. Weave a circle round him twice. Well, this thrice, thrice three circles is what you do to a devil keep them in their spot. They would call him demonic, right? I mean, he's aware of the associations here. This is not accidental on his part. And close your eyes with holy dread, and he on honeydew hath fed and drunk the milk of paradise. Well, what sort of paradise? More of a paradise lost than a paradise. So it clearly has demonic, negative uh, associations here. Anyway, very interesting poem much read in the, uh, the academy, much commented on for all the reasons I've suggested. I've, in 40 minutes, gone over a whole host of things. I throw a lot there, right? Anything I, I mean, there's a lot I didn't add and amplify. Do you want to ask any questions if, or should I go on? hearing nothing. I will come to the rhyme of the ancient mariner. Now this is also in the lyrical ballads. Very different than the others. And in his Biographia Literaria, 1817, he explains that he and Wordsworth had a, an agreement <clears throat> that they would write about the same thing, but from uh, the opposite sides. So Wordsworth would give a supernatural um, coloring to natu the natural landscape. And we've already seen that. Coleridge would do the opposite. He would have a natural landscape, or rather he would have supernatural agents and yet put them in natural forms in some way, or suggest natural uh, associations with them. But they're doing effectively the same thing. Now, when he comes to supernatural, the thing about Wordsworth, his supernatural has only positive associations, even though he, the silence and I've suggested some of the negative features of that. I don't think you can read that in Tintern Abbey. He certainly doesn't mean anything evil by it. He thinks it's a greater good. But when Coleridge comes to describe that supernatural, he has to take his, he has to take a, uh, make a choice. Is he going, because he has to be explicit about the nature of the supernatural. For Wordsworth, it's just a, 
you know, it's background. It's a reference there in the silence and the absence, whatever, and I can just hint at it and say that it's great and it revived my soul and it will revive yours too if you think into the life of things, etc. Coleridge is going to have to describe it more explicitly. So now he has to come down. Do you want to describe it as good or do you want to describe it as evil? He moves towards evil. In this poem and also in, as I say, Christabel, which also is a fragment. <coughs> Both these poems, these early poems by Coleridge were loved by the Satanic school. When I say the Satanic school, they were called, Byron Shelley uh, were, were called this. Even Keats got thrown in with the association for reasons you'll see. But that was not their own description, but they embraced it because they liked the Publicity gets you a lot of publicity. I'll say more about Byron. He was the first rock star before there were there was rock and roll. By, there was Byron. He was a phenomenon. Very interesting. But the rhyme of the ancient mariner. Now you will note here uh, the spelling is archaic, uh, and even some of the diction is archaic. Not just the spelling, but the uh, the diction. We'll use old language suggesting medieval, uh, you know, early Eng English at any rate. And in it, you can see sort of biblical references. And let me comment on this. Uh, here we see in the margin here on the left, what it, he added later to the poem. So it says 1798, but this is not accurate. Because in 1798, there was no gloss. There's no left, what we see in the left-hand column. This is a later edition. I like the later edition. I think it, it adds some interest to the poem, but that's not the original. If you look at your edition there, you won't find that, at least not in the 1798 version. That's a later addendum, and it serves a certain purpose. And one of the purposes is, I think, to ridicule a summary, uh, Cole's notes, or what are you, you know, the online versions of the study guides. He's ridiculing commentators who uh, allow you to read them and not the original, as if you got everything that you needed just by reading the summary statements. So he's ridiculing undergraduate students, in other words. <laughs> and they're like, who are not interested in the poetry, they're interested in getting through the poetry to some degree. Uh, but the story here is of an ancient mariner and three gallants bid into a wedding feast. Biblical. Story of the wedding guest and so forth. So Coleridge, and, and you'll find that throughout this poem, there are several biblical allusions. In fact, I think the imagery throughout is, is biblical. The intention of the imagery may not be biblical, but the references clearly are. So, uh, part one. And I'm not going to read it all because I'll run out of time. I don't have enough time to get through that, so I'm going to hop around a little bit. But I will read some because I think it's helpful. It is an ancient mariner, and he stoppeth one of three. By thy long beard and glittering eye, now wherefore stops thou me? The bridegroom's doors are opened wide, and I am next of kin. The guests are met, the feast is set mayst hear the merry din. He holds him with his skinny hand. There was a ship, quoth he. Hold off, unhand me, gray beard loon. Eftsoons his hand dropped he. Again, archaic language, eftsoons, never heard the phrase before. Immediately, drops his hand. But he holds him with his glittering eye. The wedding guest stood still and listens like a three years child, the mariner hath his will. Immediate sense of a supernatural occurrence here. You're being held by the eye of the ancient mariner. How is that even possible? Is it possession? Is it an evil intent? Is it a good intent? He can't move. The wedding guest, and again, remember the wedding guest, the wedding guest, the wedding, Christ the bride, the bridegroom, all of the connotations here, invited to the wedding, 
it has the positive Christian connotations here. But here we have a figure, an ancient mariner, who wants to tell a tale, and this man wants to go away. He doesn't want to come in, but he can't choose to run away. Not because of the physical power of the ancient mariner, but because of some spell he has over him. The wedding guest sat on a stone. Now I'm going to suggest the stone is not just any stone. Is it a magic stone? Is it, you know, stone where kings are consecrated? Is it Christ, that stone? You could read a Christian, you could have a Christian reading here. It's the stone that um, Jacob set his head on when he had the vision of uh, the ladder going up to heaven with angels going up and down. Is it that stone? I don't know. But I don't think it's just a stone. The, it, I think it has biblical references as throughout. Anyway, the wedding guest sat on a stone. He cannot choose but hear. And thus spake on that ancient man, the bright-eyed mariner. The ship was cheered. The harbor cleared. Merrily did we drop. Below the kirk. Kirk's the Scottish word for church. Below the kirk. Below the hill. Below the lighthouse top. So, are they going south or are they going down? It's suggestive of both because they're going below. They're not going... Now, if they, the earth is round, so if you sail far enough, you start to lose things just because of the horizon. It bends, right? And so it, sounds like it seems like you're going down because you see the top of it before it disappears entirely. So in that sense, it could just be the effect of distance. But it does have a suggestion of a, of a demonic going under the light and the church and the, and the lighthouse. The sun came up upon the left. Out of the sea came he. And he shone bright and on the right went down into the sea. Higher and higher every day till over the mast at noon. So they're going towards the equator. Sun's right above them at noon. And then there's the pause, the long dash, just like Wordsworth. The wedding guest here beat his breast for he heard the loud bassoon. So something interrupts the scene. The bride hath paced into the hall, red as a rose is she, nodding their heads before her goes the merry minstrelsy, playing their tunes and she's about to go into the wedding feast and he's been called to the wedding feast but he doesn't get there because this stupid ancient mariner has him in the side hallway. He can't, he's not invited to the wedding feast. He's kept from the wedding feast. He doesn't get in there. Yes? Yes. And the wedding guest is distressed at this. Seems to be aware of the spiritual significance of the fact that he can't get into the wedding. The wedding guest, he beat his breast, yet he cannot choose but hear. And thus spake on that ancient man, the bright-eyed mariner. And now the storm blast came, and he was tyrannous and strong. He struck with his o'ertaking wings and chased us south along. So again, the sense of um, personification of nature. The storm is like a, someone chasing them. That sense of natural objects having a, having a spiritual personified agency is throughout the poem. With sloping mass and dipping prow, as who pursued with yell and blow still treads the shadow of his foe and forward bends his head, the ship drove fast, loud roared the blast, and southward aye we fled. And now there came both mist and snow, and it grew wondrous cold. And ice, mast high, came floating by as green as emerald. And through the, dr the drifts, the snowy cliffs, did send a dismal sheen. Nor shapes of men, nor beasts we can. The ice was all between. The ice was here, the ice was there, the ice was all around. It cracked and growled and roared and howled like new noises in a swoon. Let me stop there for a second. It cracked and growled, it growled. You've heard ice when it gets really cold. It, it actually will roar. You, have you heard this? You have, up in New York, it gets, it, you can hear it cracking up. It sounds like a, a moan. Coleridge will have never heard this in his life, but he has read the uh, travelogues of Captain Cook and others in, in icy climates, and here's this. Now, let me say something about icy landscapes. Icy landscapes have since Dante's time been associated with hell. 
right? At the bottom of the inferno is ice. Even though we would naturally associate with an inferno great heat, and in general you associate heat and fire with hell, so that's the biblical description, in Dante, for various metaphorical reasons related to his understanding of matter and space, um, Ice is at the bottom of this, and Satan encased in ice. So thereafter, uh, evil is associated with an icy landscape. It's great when you're a Canadian writer because you're in hell all the time. Half the year you're in hell. And the, and the writers uh, who have something about them will know this and will be able to use that. So it's snowing outside. Mm-hmm. That's not the same thing as it's raining outside. It, the, it, it's a suggestion of evil, or it can be like to a clever writer. Uh, in Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, le- same sort of thing. The explorer uh, goes up into the Arctic, gets caught in the ice. And likewise, the monster in uh, Switzerland goes up Mont Blanc in an icy, icy uh, glacier. Sublime landscape, suggestion of, of evil and a suggestion of vastness and brightness and inhumanity. It's ho- hostile to human habitation. Uh, Coleridge is aware of all that, and I think the icy here suggests that. So he's not just going south, he's going down into evil. I think that's there. And it growls, and it growls like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour, as in the Bible it speaks of the devil. At length did cross an albatross. Now here's the famous albatross. Coleridge and his albatross. What does the albatross connote? At length it did cross an albatross, though through the fog it came. Through the fog it came. As if it had been a Christian soul, we hailed it in God's name. As if. It ate the food it ne'er had eat, and round and round it flew. The ice did split with a thunder fit, the helmsman steered us through. And A good south wind sprung up behind. The albatross did follow. And every day, for food or play, came to the mariner's hollow. In mist or cloud, on mast or shroud, it perched for vespers nine. Vespers are evening service in the Anglican church. You have vespers at the uh, time of evening, an even song, it's vespers. So it's there for vespers nine, so Christian associations. Whilst all the night through fog smoke white glimmered the white moonshine. Now moonshine, on the other hand, is associated with madness. God save thee, ancient mariner, from the fiends that plague thee thus. Why looks thou so? With my crossbow I shot the albatross. No reason given for this. He just randomly kills it. The, the mariners are happy about the albatross. It gives a little bit of color to a very dark and dreary and terrifying experience. There's a bird that flies around them and it's a cheerful thing. And he shoots it randomly, no apparent reason. And the, the gloss says, the ancient mariner inhospitably killeth the pious bird of good omen, which is a funny, I, just, I find the gloss funny. It's just like, what a strange, a, a strange rendering of the whole thing. Anyway, part two. So this is a key phase. This is a, actually a key passage in the poem that the albatross gets shot. Why does he do it? What's the, uh, what does the albatross signify? What does the killing of the albatross signify? What does the descent down into the south, into the land of ice signify? What does the wedding feast signify? The wedding guests signify the ancient mariner. All these are questions <coughs> which are not answered, but the accumulated allusions add uh, color to the text. But it is a narrative, and it's a rhyme, as we see. The sun now rose upon the right. Okay, before it rose upon what side? The left. So they've gone from one side to the other. You could see it like in uh, Dante's Inferno when he goes down to the bottom and he thinks he's crawling down and then suddenly he finds that he's crawling up. 
he's still on the back of the beast that goes so he's gone from one part of the world into the other hemisphere here he's not gone into another hemisphere he's gone from gone down to the south pole and now he's going up on the other side i think that's what's going on here because the the sun now rises on the other side now it actually doesn't rise on the other side but i think that's the suggestion here right because the sun rises here and sets here well now it's suddenly the other way around which actually doesn't happen because it's still on the left the whole time right you go anyway but but note that it, he explicitly says the sun now rose upon the right so everything is upside down so the part one is essential and the whole poem pivots on it the sun now rose upon the right out of the sea came he okay comes out of the sea still hid in mist and on the left went down into the sea so the opposite of what happened before a mirror image of it and the good south wind still blew behind well before it was a north wind blowing them and now it's a south wind uh, but no sweet bird did follow nor any day for food or play came to the mariner's hollow and I had done an hellish thing. And it would work him woe. For all averred, I had killed the bird that made the breeze to blow. Ah, wretch, said they, the bird to slay that made the breeze to blow. So they add, they add a, an agency to the bird. The bird was not only a fun creature that followed us. It was the cause of the wind. Because the winds, you killed the bird, there's no more wind. nor rim, dim nor red like Christ's own head, the glorious sun up wrist. Then, Oliver, I had killed the bird that brought the fog and mist. So they immediately reversed their verdict. First, you killed something that brought good things, but now it's the opposite. So well done. What we find in this is the, the, um, his companions here are complicit in an evil act. They're, they're happy that he's killed the bird. "'Twas right, said they, such birds to slay that bring the fog and mist. The fair breeze blew, the white foam flew, the furrow followed free. We were the first that ever burst into that silent sea. Down dropped the breeze, the sails dropped down. "'Twas sad as sad could be. And we did speak only to break the silence of the sea." all in a hot and copper sky so before cold 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 now the other side no no wind and hot 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 so they go into a hellish in the sense of the ice with dantean associations hell but now we have more conventional associations of hell which is just heat uh, insufferable heat all in a hot and copper sky, the bloody sun at noon, right up above the mast that stands. So that if it's at noon, the sun up above them, now they're at the equator on the other side. No bigger than the moon. Day after day, day after day, we stuck, nor breath, nor motion, as idle as a painted ship upon a painted ocean. By the way, reference to this, I think I mentioned this in the C.S. Lewis class, uh, in um, Prince Caspian, right? And the picture on the wall, painted sea, and he falls, and then suddenly they get brought in through the picture. The, he, he, Lewis plainly loved this poem as well. He pulls the albatross in as well, by the way, in uh, Voyage of the Dawn Treader, but never mind. And there it's a Christ figure for, for Lewis. So it's not always Aslan, sometimes it's other forms, sometimes it's a cat in uh, Horse and His Boy. Right, so it's all over the place, right? Different associations. You think it's always going to be a lion. It's not always a lion. But um, anyway, and then the famous line. Water, water everywhere, and all the boards did shrink. Water, water everywhere, nor any drop to drink. If you drink the ocean water, you're going to die more quickly because it will dehydrate you so you have water all around you you want to drink it because you're parched with thirst you're dehydrated and you desperately want water but if you drink that it's going to 
expedite the process. So you can't do it. So it's just this fig uh, figure of temptation and, and torture. So they are in a hellish place. And water has the associations of the Spirit of God as well. And they're in a place where there is no Spirit of God. I think Coleridge is aware of all those illusions. The very deep did rot. O oh Christ, that ever this should be. Yea, slimy things did crawl with legs upon the slimy sea. About, about in reel and rout, the death fires danced at night. The water, like a witch's oils, burnt green and blue and white. And some in spirits assured were of the spirit that plagued us so. Nine fathom deep, he had followed us from the land of ice and snow. And every tongue, through utter drought, was withered to the root. He could not speak, no more than if we had been choked with soot. Ah, well a day, what evil looks had I from old and young. Instead of the cross, the albatross about my neck was hung. Oh, so, okay, so the shipmates go from being angry with him for killing the bird that causes the breeze to blow to being thankful to him for getting rid of the bird that causes the mist and snow. And now, in the midst of evil, they want somebody to be the scapegoat and they throw the albatross around his neck. Famous. Albatross around my neck. It becomes a figure of speech in English. You're the scapegoat. You're bearing the sins of the ship. We're going to blame you for it. It's a secular way of telling a Christian story, perhaps. But he associates it with evil as well, which makes it troublesome. And it also is like the nine that he comes up from. Of course. So you can read, da I think you have to read Dante in the text. This is how great literature works. I think it, it has multiple illusions and it's almost spot the illusions. Who's clever enough to spot them? And, and actually it rewards it, but you can say, okay, he's pulling in Dante here. He's pulling in a scriptural allusion here. He's pulling in Milton. He's pulling in, and, and you say, okay, so it's an interplay of one text with other texts and it enriches the text for the reader. As I say, I do this in first year, but nobody's going to pick up what you just said. It's just not there. They haven't read it, but now they've read it. Okay, you can start to pick up those things. But the albatross put his neck hung, and note the gloss here. I'm not even going to get into reading this, but it, it becomes positively ridiculous here. Okay, part three. There passed a weary time, each throat was parched and glazed each eye. A weary time, a weary time. He does, he repeats himself a, a few times in the uh, lines here. How, ga how glazed each weary eye. When looking westward, I beheld a something in the sky. At first, it seemed a little speck, and then it seemed a mist. It moved and moved and took at last a certain shape, I wist. A speck, a, sp a mist, a shape, I wist. And still it neared and neared, and as if it dodged a water sprite, it plunged and tacked and veered. With throats unslaked, with black lips baked, we could nor laugh nor wail. Through utter drought, all dumb we stood. I bit my arm, I sucked the blood, and cried, a sail, a sail. Can't, his mouth so dry, he can't speak. So he bites his arm and sucks the blood to allow himself to speak. Now, in the underworld of Homer, he gives them a draft of blood, or gives them blood to speak so that they can speak. The shades can't speak until they're given blood to drink. He bites his, own net, bites his own arm to get the blood that will allow him to. So he's fallen into, is he in the underworld of sorts? I think that's the association at any rate. It's, he's in hell. With throats unslaked, and the reason he does it is because he sees a sail. Hooray, we're saved. With throats unslaked, with black lips baked, we, agape, they heard me crawl, gramercy. They for joy did grin, and all at once their breath drew in as they were drinking all. See, see, I cried, she tacks no more. Hither to work us wheel. Without a breeze, without a tide, she steadies with upright keel. The western wave was all aflame. The day was well nigh done. Almost upon the western wave rested the broad, bright sun. When that strange shape drove suddenly betwixt us and the sun. And straight the sun was flecked with bars 
Heaven's mother send us grace, as if through a dungeon grate he peered with broad and burning face. Pirates of the Caribbean stuff. The other way around, of course. Alas, thought I, and my heart beat loud, how fast she nears and nears. Are those her sails that glance in the sun like restless gossamers? Gossamers are the, the, the uh, little feathers under the geese, the little tiny airy feathers. That's a gossamer, often used in poetic vocabulary. That's a gossamer. Are those her ribs through which the sun did peer as through a grate? And is that woman all her crew? Is that a death? And are there two? Is death that woman's make? Is this Satan's sin and death? Is it a, it's a demonic um, portrait at any rate. Sounds like the woman of, in the, in the red dress in the book of Revelation. Her lips were red, her looks were free, her locks were yellow as gold, her skin was as white as leprosy, the nightmare light in death was she who thicks man's blood with cold. The naked hulk alongside came, and the twain were casting dice. The game is done! I've won, I've won, quoth she, and whistles thrice. The sun's rim dips. The stars rush out. At one's stride comes the dark. With far heard whisper over the sea, off shot the specter bark. We listened and looked sideways up. We look sideways up, so they're all on their sides. Fear at my heart, as at a cup, my lifeblood seemed to sip. The stars were dim the thick, and thick the night. The steerman's face by his lamp gleamed white. From the sails the dew did drip, till clomb above the eastern bar, the horned moon with one bright star, till within the nether tip. One by one by the star dog moon, too quick for groan or sigh, each turns this face with a ghastly pang and cursed me with his eye. Remember the mariner's eye? Now it's these guys. Can't speak. Four times five living men, and I heard nor sigh nor groan. With a heavy thump, a lifeless lump, they drop down one by one. I'm not going to do that 200 times. But it's just like the bodies drop, 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 drop. Why? Because life and death has won them. There's a game for their life. The souls did from their bodies fly. They fled to bliss or woe. And every soul, it passed me by like the whiz of my crossbow. Okay. So, very clever poem. Uh, and the illusions are, um, it's, it's well connected. It's a very well wrought work, this poem. Unlike the previous one, which is not uh, a, a bad poem, but this one is well interconnected, well thought through, well thought out, and it's not going to end as a fragment either. It will conclude uh, in a totality. But I'm not going to get to it today because I'm, I'm out of time, uh, and I don't want to get into the part four, um, other than to say then he breaks back from that sequence to the uh, wedding. wedding guest speaking to the ancient mariner because he's afraid, well, if the body fell down, and the ancient mariner is one of the bodies that fell down, then who is the guy that's got him here? Right? Because he's holding me and he was dead and he's been possessed by life and death. What's going on here? Uh, right? At, of course, he interjects at this point. He does so on behalf of the reader as well. So he creates suspense in the process. Very clever, artfully done. Splendid stuff. I'll come back to it next time. I don't want to leave it off of that. So I'll pick it up next time with, uh, at this point, part four of uh, Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner. Okay?